Good morning from Vietnam. Good afternoon to you, Rob. Thanks a lot for spending your afternoon joining our inside sharing shows and sharing your story with our audience. And on behalf of the listeners, we would want to say thank you to you. Well, thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Hey, Rob. Uh, You've been to Vietnam twice already, and then there is, you know, the last time that you came here is 18 years ago, right? So it's a good time to pay a visit. It is, it is. And I think we're starting digitally through this uh, session, and then hopefully I'll, I'll get to come and, and visit in person at some point. Yep, and I trust that day will happen. So you have new friends, new family here that will welcome you and take you around town, okay? Thank you. Yeah, I love that. Sure. And Rob, uh, since you've been in this country already, you know our culture is going to be very honored for our audience to have you to have introduced a little bit about who you are and the work that you do. Could you do that for us? Sure. So, um, hi everybody. I'm Rob Fulby. I am the CEO and founder of Ignite360. And we're a marketing research firm. We provide insights and strategy and training to our clients. Um, and so we do a lot of um, focus group type work and survey work and try to understand how people are thinking and feeling and helping our clients build an empathetic connection to their consumer so that they can make better products and services. Um, coming out of that work, because empathy is so important, we identified some of the things that were getting in people's way of being empathetic with others. Um, and we call those the five steps to empathy. It's the things that you need to do in the moment in order to, to reach empathy. Mm -hmm. And so we have some training programs that we do based around that. I now do a lot of speaking and workshops and things. And I wrote a book. Um, I'll hold it up right here. Hello. Um, <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It came out earlier this year. It's called Tell Me More About That, Solving the Empathy Crisis One Conversation at a Time. And it looks at all five of those steps, but it uses my own personal stories, uh, doing research and other experiences in my life to help bring to life uh, the barriers, the times that I've failed trying to be empathetic um, or the times that I've maybe gotten it right and what I've actually done to do that so that the reader has the opportunity to reflect for themselves and maybe when they're in a situation in the future, they're able to then draw from um, the stories and be inspired to make a different choice and, and go down a different path. Wow. Well, you know what? I, I want to say congratulations for, for that. Uh, we have a lot of executive friends. By the time that they, uh, they retire, they, normally we, they told me two different two things that they regret not doing. Okay? And the first thing is uh, about um, running their own organization, running their own firm, you know, and using the expertise uh, that they can make for organization when not doing it for themselves. The second is uh, writing a book to share their stories and expertise and stories with uh, with and you know people around the world, but they yet writing it also. So we try to push them. It's never late to do both. So you've been running, you've been doing both of them, you know, beautifully. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Something I always appreciated and noticed when we on those visits, as you mentioned, uh, to Vietnam was the sort of entrepreneurial spirit that I found amongst uh, Vietnamese people and, um, you know, opening their own shops and their own businesses and, and having the courage to take that leap um, to try something on their own. I think that was really inspiring and I, I appreciated seeing that um, when I was traveling around the country. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Rob, we're going to get back to the book at a later time, all right? And then, uh, but first, we want to examine the journey that makes you to run, uh, founding the company Ignite360 and run the uh, business like that. So allow us to travel time together, would you? Okay. All righty. So um, 
let's travel time. When I was young, I always wanted to become an astronaut. So wearing the astronaut suit and jumping in the different planet. So that sounds fascinating to me back then. But life didn't give me any chance to do anything near it, right? And it took me to the human resource space and in the talent development, talent solutions for, you know, for my career, most of my career. So, uh, Rob, when you were young, what was your dream about yourself for the future, though? Oh, well, um, like yourself, I wanted to fly, except I wasn't necessarily looking to fly into space, but I did want to be a commercial airline pilot. Um, I was always intrigued with the idea of going someplace and seeing new places and experiences and having those adventures. And then uh, at some point, my dad told me that I'd have to do a lot of math uh, to be an airline pilot. And I'm not a fan of math, so I thought, well, I should probably find something else. And the career then that through a lot of my teenage years and into college, what I was interested in and what I went to, to university for was to study journalism. Mm. Um, because I also liked uncovering the truth mm. and sharing the stories of other people. Um, I felt that that was really important and, and being able to use words to, to convey uh, what was actually happening. Mm -hmm. And so back then I wanted to, to, to do that. I studied for it and then something happened in college and I thought, oh, I don't want to be doing a different, to covering a totally different story every single day. It seemed like journalists, it's, it was always just too varied and different. Maybe I want something a little bit more stable. Um, and I think I was rationalizing that for myself at the time because I wanted to do a study abroad program. I went to Syracuse University here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and they had this, a well-known study abroad program, including over in London. And I wanted to go to London for my entire junior year, my third year of college, uh, to study, but I was not going to be able to be a journalism major if I did that. So I think I kind of talked myself out of it so that I could go have the London experience. Mm -hmm. And that was an amazing experience. Um, and then, you know, I, I kind of ignored marketing research um, through most of my career until 15 years or so ago, I got laid off uh, from a job, no, 16 years ago, 2006, I got laid off uh, from a job, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. And um, some of the, the other research firms I was in kid marketing at that point. I was working for a toy company mm. and that's the job that I got laid off from. And through that job and the marketing work that I was doing, I knew some of the research firms that specialized in doing kid marketing. And so they started to, and when they knew I was available, they gave me some project work here and there, you know, help write this PowerPoint, do some strategic thinking with us. Um, but it didn't really dawn on me that I should become a moderator and, and, and take that on as a career until about a year later. Um, and the owner of one of those firms was here in San Francisco with her husband. And she had dinner with myself and my husband and the four of us were talking. And she said, you know, I'm looking to hire somebody that's just like you, that has the strategic thinking, is good with the PowerPoint, but that is also you know, able to moderate. And we played what I call the name game, trying to figure out like, well, who do we know in common that might be good for that? And couldn't come up with anybody. Mm. And a few days later, I was um, at a swimming pool here in the Bay Area uh, doing the backstroke. It was a beautiful sunny day. And all of a sudden it just hit me. I was like, well, wait a minute. I like talking to people. Maybe, maybe I'd be good at that moderating thing. Mm. And so I asked a friend um, who was in the field and she was like, oh my God, you'd be amazing at it. Here's where you go to get trained. And she had her own independent practice. And she said, well, you know, let me know when you're done and I'll see if I can use you on a project. So that was uh, around this time. It was mid-November of um, uh, 2006. So that January, I got trained to moderate. And then in February, I found myself standing in the frozen vegetable aisle 
of a Walmart in Allentown, Pennsylvania, which is outside of Philadelphia, uh, waiting for shoppers to um, engage with uh, a test product mm. that we were studying. And that was my very first research project, and I was absolutely hooked. I loved it. Um, and that's what, what got me my start into the industry. <sighs> So it's not long ago. It's 2006, and and and, uh, and then starting by January of 2007, right? And 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 when you got into this space, so what did you do prior to to get into this uh, to this? Yeah. So um, I mean, if you really want my whole resume, out of college, you know, so I gave up the journalism thing. I started. Uh, I, I switched my major to television, and radio, film management and decided I wanted to work in Hollywood and I wanted to be an executive in Hollywood, um, what was known as a television programming executive. So they decide what's going to be on TV when and you know which shows get, get picked up and, and renewed and, and everything. And so I moved out to LA right after college, uh, knowing very few people and knowing nobody in the industry. And my very first job, I actually got a temporary job as a uh, legal secretary at a law firm. And that, you know, was they really just there to help them move some boxes. They were moving offices and then they found out, oh, he's actually really good working the phones and um, can do some of the other you know, skills that they needed. So they hired me and I worked there for about eight months. Um, and I thought, well, this is a good way to just get my you know uh, footing and understand the industry more and then I can try to find something else because I knew that wasn't going to be forever but that was a stepping stone sort of job um, and it was really cool they represented this was back in the early 90s they represented every big star um, uh, back in at that time from Arnold Schwarzenegger to Bruce Willis and Demi Moore to um, so as uh, Sylvester Stallone, a client, I think Kim Basinger, like really big names from, from 30 years ago. Mm. So it was really fun. I ended up getting a job um, as a legal secretary over at Fox Broadcasting, um, mm. which was on the 20th Century Fox studio lot. That was also awesome and fun. Um, then I moved over to HBO. I was still in this sort of business affairs, legal affairs space. Um, you know, doing more negotiations and things like that. And then I realized at one point, like, okay, that's intellectually stimulating, but I'm not really passionate about it. And I believed that it was important to be passionate about the work that I do. I didn't want to just have a job. Um, I really wanted to have a career and something that I was really engaged in and emotionally invested in. And so I realized the thing that did that for me was marketing. Mm. And so I started to... I took a class on marketing um, in the entertainment industry and started networking with anybody that I knew, like I wanted to get a job in marketing. And also people were telling me, you know, do I stay in entertainment or do I go outside of the field? And ultimately what people were telling me was leave entertainment, get more general experience. They said, you can always come back. But if you grow up in that one field, it doesn't translate as well into other sort of sectors. Mm. So I, I heard that. And I was like, OK. Um, one of the people that I, I talked to worked at a PR firm in New York. They actually had an opening uh, for a, a junior publicist. So I applied and got the job. I packed my things up and moved across country. Also in November of that was 1995. Uh, I moved from Los Angeles to New York City and took a leap there, um, but worked at that PR firm for about three years, got to do a lot of promotional marketing. Um, Starbucks was our largest client mm -hmm. um, at the top, and I got to do a lot of fun things with them and some other firms or other clients that we had. And then after three years, I was like, ah, you know, I want to learn a little bit more about marketing and marketing communications. So I moved to a different agency, did different work. And then I went out on my own um, for a few years offering sort of general marketing um, and promotions uh, to smaller businesses. Um, then I was in New York when 9-11 happened. Um, and that, you know, obviously was a terrible event. 
but also at the time, all the new business prospects, like nobody knew what they were going to do after 9-11 happened. And so all new business just kind of dried up and disappeared. So I decided, well, I should go back and work at a large company because mm. I'll have that sort of safety and security. So I went and I got a job at Kraft Foods, mm. um, worked there for a couple of years. And then I that led to, I was doing promotional marketing. So coupons and uh, partnerships with other companies to promote the product. Um, that led to a job at this toy company and brought me to San Francisco um, in 2004. Mm. So that, and then I was there for a couple of years when I got laid off and then I found research. But the thing that was interesting throughout all of those jobs that I had, especially the ones that were in marketing, I always loved those interactions that I got to have with consumers, whether I was going to a focus group and, and watching from behind the mirror, or I was at an event uh, where we were handing out samples of a new Starbucks product, and I got to see the reaction of the consumer and what they really thought about it. I absolutely loved that. And so, you know, it was, the, all of that is marketing research ultimately. And, and so, the signs were there for what I wanted to do mm. with my career, what I should be doing, but I wasn't paying attention to it yeah. um, or listening in the right way. And, and I always say like, you know, the universe puts things in front of you and will continue to put some, the same thing in front of you until you actually pay attention to it, whether it's an obstacle or a signpost saying, go this way. Um, and so you need to be aware of what's coming up and what's being presented to you. So, when I did finally fall into research, it's like, oh my God, this is what I had been looking for my entire career. Mm. Uh, and even on top of that, I find you know what I like about being at an agency and consulting with clients is that it's different every single day, mm. which is the thing that I talked myself out of when I was in college and I was switching my major. Um, and it doesn't escape me that what I do is very much like journalism, where we're trying to find out the truth um, about people and their behavior and their attitudes and opinions and bringing that forward to our audience, mm. which would be our clients. Um, so it, it, it's, I've come kind of full circle in many ways. See, Rob, uh, you know, it's beautiful to see all the dogs connected, right? And it's connected, you know, like Steve Jobs says, all the dogs can be only be connected backwards. So now you're doing it. Actually, you also fulfill your dream as a pilot in a different way, you know. So you're not sitting in the in the cockpit and 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 fly the plane, but then you you know you've been frequent traveler, right? And then you meet a lot of people around the world through the consumer inside projects that you are doing. So you know, it's just different things and then you bring that journalism, the 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 drive of wanna know the insides of you know of the people of the stories and then bring it out, you know, to the work that you're doing. So everything is really beautifully connected. And then also one thing that you mentioned in here that, that I and I need to say first. November seems to have a lot of beautiful uh, things that happen in your life, right? It's also a month of, for your birthday, so we want to say happy birthday early to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Rob, tell us why all the, normally, you know, I noted in, in my note in here that seems to be a lot of events happen in your life, happen in November. And is that the month for reflection and that makes you to change course or what happened in November to you? <laughs> about November. Oh. Well, yeah, as you point out, I was born in November and I think I'm, you know, I always feel very you know, connected to the month. Um, a lot of people have issues with November because it's, you know, darker, it's getting colder, it might start snowing. Um, but I, I really love it. And I also find it exciting because the winter holidays are, are getting started and they're right around the corner. And that's my favorite, one of my favorite times of year. Um, I don't know if it's, is it coincidence that all these things happened in November or is there something larger at play? I don't know because the decision 
for me to go out on my own was made also in November. Um, so I, I don't know. I'll have to explore that further. But November has a lot of significance for me, yeah. for sure. See, Rob, that's a sign there that happened. You know, November seems to be a lot of good things that happen, right? Exactly. <laughs> I, 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 I felt like that because my wife told me um, last year, and it, and then she started to, uh, you know, put things into a system, and she started to show me that hey, it looks like that a lot of things happen in the month of October in your life, you know, like. And it seems to be a very, you know, good things that happen in that that month. And because it's my birthday, so she said that maybe that, you know, that's when you have a lot more energy, you have a lot of more, you know, like, uh, uh, yeah, exciting things to do and that attract, you know, like um, new opportunities or so. So it, I'm, I'm intrigued huh? to figure it out in your head also. Well, a belated happy birthday to you, yeah, which you. Uh, when in October is your birthday. Yeah, uh, it's 13. So it just happened? 13, 1, 3. Yeah. 1, 3. Yeah. Okay, so three weeks ago. Yeah, three weeks ago, three right. weeks ago. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. And then your, your journey in, in uh, Ignite 360s has been for over 10 years, right? Yeah, so January will be our 12th anniversary. Okay. It's in January. I'll put on my calendar to send a, a, a you know happy anniversary, happy 12th anniversary to, to you and yeah. your organization. So how do you feel after 12, you know, 11 plus years running solo? Um, yeah, I mean, we've got uh, 15 employees and, um, you know, it, it's it's gone by fast. It's hard to believe that it's been 12 years. Um, and I say that even when it was 10 years or nine years, um, you know, it, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's hard sometimes to believe, um, because it's gone quickly. Um, so you don't re really recognize it, but I do see the growth that we've experienced both, you know, revenue wise, of course, or people, but in the way that we do our work, um, you know, the, the types of clients that we have and, and the work that we're doing for them. Um, and, you know, as a, as the CEO, the founder, the owner, I think I'm always um, thinking about, like what's next, where are we headed and, and what's to come. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Rob, I want to bring you back into that January of uh, 2011. 2011. All right. And, uh, and I want to, uh, I want to ask you back then, because you have the skill, you have the knowledge, you have the drive to run, uh, to, to, and the love for, for marketing and consumer insights, right? You can go into a corporate world, enjoy the comfortability of, of, of a corporate life with everything, you know, like, so, you know, everything's ready for you. And at the end of the month, you're going to get, uh, you know, your, your secure paycheck and everything, right? But you decided to, um, you know, like go solo. You know where you know which what strength you know did you, did you give to yourself back then to open your own firm though? Well, you know, as you say all those things, <laughs> my mind was kind of going yeah. Um, <laughs> I think there, I think there's a few things that that drive me. I mean, one was the desire to see to do things the way I wanted to do them or felt that they should be done. Mm. Um, and another, you know, it is about control. Um, I'd probably be lying if I didn't say, you know, I wanted to be able to be in control of things. Um, but it was really around like, Hey, we, that we, me, the company, there is an opportunity to do things differently and better for our clients. And, 
you know, not just give them data, mm -hmm. um, but to actually give them data with recommendations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here's what we're hearing and here's what you can do about it mm -hmm. um, to try to help people and, and be of service and, and help people grow. Um, when it came down in that November, um, you know, the, the whole story was that I was a contractor, I was a consultant to this other firm um, and they needed to make me an employee to, for legal reasons. And I apparently, the owner of the other firm, she would joke with me that I would make a little scrunchy face, um, like I had an allergic reaction to being an employee. And so I had asked for, um, I, I said, well, you know, I'm open to being an employee, but I've worked really hard to grow this firm. Um, where I was uh, helping her, um, I'd like to have some equity and, mm. and have some ownership in it because we've grown really nicely and, and everything. And um, she came back to me and, and unfortunately wasn't able to do that. Mm. So I, I was like, okay, well, I understand. Um, you know, we show me show me the contract, show me what the the package is going to look like, the money and everything, um, and we'll you know, figure that out. And so she did. And it was in November. Um, and I was in my kitchen here in this house in the other room. And I had, I had delayed looking at the contract um, for a while because I just didn't want to. Um, but she kept saying like, hey, I need your feedback on this. And so I opened my computer up and I looked, I pulled up the document and was looking at it. And in, you know, legal documents, it'll identify the name of an individual or an organization and then how they are referred to in the doc in the legal document. Mm. And so in this case, it said Rob Volpe. And then it said in all capital letters with quotation marks and closed parentheses, employee. Mm. And I didn't get further than that. I saw that and every fiber in my body was screaming out to me, no, this isn't you, this is wrong, don't do this. Oh. And I mean, head to toe, just loud and strong, that message was, was coming through to me. And it was, it made me pause, because I was like, I, I hadn't heard a message from the universe like that before, um, and my intuition or however you want to describe it. Mm. And I thought, all right, there's something to this. I need to, I need to do something about this. I can't, it would, I, it, it would be bad for me to ignore the message that I was getting. And so I took a deep breath and thought, all right, I need to look into going out on my own and figuring out what that looked like. And mm. so I started, uh, reaching out in my network to find a lawyer mm. that I could talk to and, and make all that start. So that happened in November. Um, I gave notice at the end of November and we decided amicably that I would work through to the holidays, um, to Christmas and wrap everything up. I didn't want to leave the clients in a lurch. I didn't want to leave that other firm in a, a bad spot either. Um, and then you know, in the meantime, some work started to line up for my new company. Um, and so that quickly started to fill my schedule. Um, so when we started, you know, in early January, there was nothing but, you know, excitement and promise and, you know, a lot of things to figure out, but confidence that I knew that we could. Yeah. And I also knew, and I knew from that prior experience, remember I had said I was out on my own um, about 10 years earlier, I knew from that experience that the financial kind of roller coaster, because mm -hmm. that was going to be the biggest challenge for me and being comfortable with not knowing where the next project was going to come from, not knowing that at the end of the month there was going to be a paycheck waiting for me. Mm -hmm. um, and that I found is when you're out on your own, that's the trade off is that you, you're giving up that financial security that you have when you're working for somebody else because you know, it's their problem or you're in such a large company that it doesn't matter. Um, so that's kind of what was going on in 
January 2011. I think there was excitement. There were some nerves, um, but it was really like, okay, let's let's do this and do this well and see where it takes us. Wow. And you do very, very well. Congratulations. More Thank to you. come, more wonderful things to come, all right? <laughs> and Rob, before we move to the book, the, I want to ask the last question in this, in, uh, on, on, on the current things that you do, all right? So uh, there will be a lot of people out there want to get into the space of what you are doing, all right? And our talk is to, our plan is to help them uh, and, and, and build that competency for them to get into that and be successful. So would there be any skills that they need to obtain and master now so that they, when they get into the space of what you are doing, they can, you know, they can fast track their career and grow? Sure. Yeah. So, um, there's a lot of different, if you, if you start to look at marketing research as a field, mm. there's a lot of different types of agencies. There's a lot of different types of work that's done from, um, you know, qualitative work, which is a lot of what we do, which is talking to people. Mm. And then there's quantitative work, which we also do, but that's more about data and surveys and large numbers of people. Mm. Um, and you have a different sort of analytical skill set or mindset to do that. So, you know, any sort of training uh, for quantitative work and statistics and analytics um, for either an MBA is really important, I think, or some sort of business experience. I actually do not have an advanced degree, but all of those years I spent doing other things um, in marketing gave me exposure and understanding of how business works and how marketing works so that I can give better recommendations to the client because it's not just uh, anymore in our industry it isn't just about data collection or saying well you know four out of five people prefer you know whatever the, this type of chewing gum um it's really understanding okay so yeah four out of five people prefer this type of chewing gum here's how you brand the other brand can win one of those people over it's making the recommendations mm. um as well as as providing just the information so you're really becoming more of a consultant mm. to be a consultant learn the skill in the quantitative and then also learn you know like the skill in the qualitative field also right right and don't be afraid to just jump in if you can if you have an opportunity to um you know work with a research company even at an entry level position like give it a try mm. you know you can all change and, and go do something else wonderful thanks for sharing <laughs> and tell us along the way you 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 where since when you have the idea of writing your own book rob you know um i've always i've always loved writing that's always been a preferred communication style for me um and when i became when i when I started the company, I had people tell me, you know, 11 years ago, they're like, oh, well, now that you're a CEO, what book are you going to write? Because that's what CEOs do. And I was like, with what time? I'm busy. I'm launching a company. It's not just that I've, I've stepped into an established company. I was trying to get something off the ground. And so that, but that, it sat with me and I knew like, yeah, that'd be awesome to write a book at some point. This particular book, though, came about six years ago, also in late October, early November. Oh. Um, <laughs> there's something to it. Um, where we had, uh, I, I was speaking at a university. I was talking to a consumer behavior or marketing class. Um, and I was telling stories. I was explaining the industry. But I was also talking about the role of empathy because there is an empathy crisis in our society where mm. we aren't listening to each other and understanding where we're coming from. And it's, it's creating problems. Um, so I was telling some stories about 
going into people's homes for ethnographic research and times that I was challenged with empathy. And I found that the students were completely wrapped in attention. They were just like, you know, sitting there, you know, jaw open, holding their face in their hands, listening to every single word that I, I was saying. They weren't on their laptops. Their phones were, were not, you know, they weren't on social media or anything like that. They were paying attention mm. and this inside me said, this is what you need to write about. These are the stories that you need to tell. And so I thought, Oh, okay, that's great. Now that was 2016. It's now 2022. Um, so shortly after that, I started to write the book and just sort of tell the stories. Um, and I went through, numerous rounds. I think I had four rounds of drafts of the book, um, but I would also take a year off. Um, you know, I did a lot of writing in 2017 and then not much until, you know, six, eight months later in 2018. And then I wrote a lot in 2018 and got to a fourth draft. And then in 2019, I wrote nothing that got really busy at work. And then the same thing in 2020, I was going to, spend some time writing and the pandemic happened and I had to really focus my attention on keeping my business going. So I ended up um, engaging a publisher in November, 2020. And I remember um, again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> to publish the book and then spent a lot of last year making revisions and proofreading and editing and more editing and, um, until the book finally came out in February of this year um, and then recorded an audio book. So the book's available in hardcover. Uh, it's available in an audio book that I narrate uh, and then also like an ebook so people can find it uh, wherever. So, so I always knew I had a book in me. I didn't know what the book was going to be um, until I had that, that moment of inspiration um, and then, you know, it, it, it took its time and there's a, a healer that I work with here in San Francisco. And at one point, I think it was in 2018, I was in the middle of working on the book and I was talking about it and I was feeling pressure. Like I wanted to get this out. We need, we need more empathy. And, and she just said to me, she's like, there's no rushing divine timing. Just let it, let it happen the way it's supposed to happen. And I think that's ultimately what did occur. Well, you have to have empathy for yourself too, because of all the busy works and then, so, so this book is about empathy. Tell us more about that. Tell us more about that. What is that, that, who is the audience and what is that that you're writing in there? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, tell, tell you more about, tell me more about that. <laughs> so the book goes into, as I mentioned, um, you know, there, there are these common barriers that all of us experience where we're um, trying to have empathy with somebody else. And so we started to look at what those things were and how do you actually overcome them. And so through that process, we developed the five, what we call the five steps to empathy, mm -hmm. which is about dismantling your judgment, asking good questions, actively listening, using or integrating into understanding and then using solution imagination. Yeah. And so the book brings all of that to life, but I didn't want to just write like a textbook or something. I wanted to write a book that people would want to read and to be entertained by. And so I used narrative storytelling as my technique where I just share my stories um, from going into strangers' homes or going into um, the National Rifle Association, the gun show for research um, and what I, that experience was like for me and how I had to dismantle my judgment and was I going to be able to do that. Um, and that way, through that process, the reader is entertained and they're engaged. Um, they're fun, interesting stories, but it's also planting a seed in their mind so that when they are in a situation, they may not be going to a gun show, but they may be um, faced with interacting with somebody that's very different from them. They remember those stories and it helps them have the courage to make a different choice and to try to reach a place of empathy. Um, so the book works in, on that particular level uh, directly. 
Um, and then, you know, it is a lot of my stories from doing research. So if you are interested in marketing research, it's a really good behind the scenes sort of um, book as well to read from that perspective. Mm. And who's the audience that you, uh, that this, this book is for? Uh, it's a general audience. So it's anybody that's looking to improve their empathy skills, um, you know, to learn more about themselves. So it, it's in personal growth and professional development. I've had, um, you know, college students reading it and I've heard from seniors uh, that have read it and loved it as well because, you know, all of us can benefit from, from being more empathetic. Mm. Earlier you say that uh, the whole students, they, they pay attention to every single word you shared during that event in 2016, right? And it's because of the, the world is facing with em empathy crisis. And a lack of empathy may, makes us lack of being a human. And, and you know, the work that you do will help us to regain our human beings and be more empathetic towards one another, towards ourselves. So thanks for doing that. I would definitely get back to you on a separate note and asking how we can have you, uh, you know, a, a sign a book for, for us so that we, uh, you know, yes. all right. And uh, so I have two last questions for you for this uh, talk today. And, uh, and Rob, my wife and I, we have been in the quest to help people improve their ability to think. Because um, we believe that our thinking abilities these days diminishing. So, uh, and if, if we have a, a chance to talk to an expert like you are, who works in both a lot of thinking, and we, we want to pick your brain on this so that people can, can learn from you. So, Rob, how have you been helping you to improve your ability to think over the years? Mm. Um, that's a really great question. I think um, I'm naturally curious. Mm. I'm curious about how things work, about why people do the things that they do, behave the way that they do, and what we can do about it. Mm. So. I think I allow myself to be led by my curiosity, oh. but then I, so I'm asking a lot of questions. I'm reading a lot of different things, um, you know, and whether it's fiction or nonfiction, I'm trying to, or, or the news, I'm trying to learn. Um, and then it's in that processing uh, phase thinking critically about like, well, what does this actually mean? What are the implications of it? Um, and then, you know, so what can we do about it? So I think I'm always looking at many angles of life from that perspective. Mm, thanks for sharing that. So, so naturally you're a curious person asking, you know, a lot of questions to, you know, connecting the things, right? And then reading and learning constantly so that it grow your ability to think and then be intentional in, in, in your thinking through the critical question, critical thinking, and, and thank you for sharing that. You know, you, we, we are writing a book on the topic of thinking after we interview so many people, we should start to see a train or, or that. So I would definitely put your stories into that book also, Rob, all right? <laughs> Please, thank you. I would love to, love to see that when you're finished. Yeah, sure, sure. And uh, the last question is uh, this. We, we knew how you were when you were young, all right? So you wanted to become a commercial pilot and you're not one now, but then you travel in frequently. You meet a lot of people around the world. That's what a pilot do anyhow, right? So you want to right. become an, 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 uh, a journalist, right? But your works now also involve a lot of writing, a lot of finding the insights, a lot of things to unveil and share with to your clients. And so it's similar things to what a journalist is doing, all right? You start your own company, you have your the first book, congratulations for all the amazing things that you've been doing. Now, let's travel forward into the future, okay? Is there anything that you are working on, you are about to introduce to the world? Would you share with us so we can celebrate with you in advance? 
Sure. So um, I am doing a lot more speaking and training programs um, and also working on launching some online training around empathy specifically. Mm. So, so I would say stay tuned for that. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Rob, I uh, thank you for spending your, your afternoon joining our show and sharing your stories and advice to our audience. And there's a lot of amazing things that, that I, I wrote down in here. I definitely will share with, uh, with our friends and our audience today. But then uh, I'm looking forward to share this whole episode to, to the, our listener around the world in six weeks, seven weeks times. And uh, one day I trust that we're gonna meet in person Okay, and I hope that February trip we'll be able to swing by to San Francisco and have a cup of coffee together. That's chance my wife and I will be able to say hello to your family and 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 with Domino directly also, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I would I would enjoy that. I look forward to it. Thank you very much. Okay, my friend, you have a wonderful uh, evening and say hello to everybody for us. Okay, will do, and, and same to you. Thank you. Bye-bye, okay. Rob. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.